Today we are going to talk about bronchi. This is the series on histology of the lung explained by a lung pathologist and today's topic is the bronchi. Okay, so let me just go back to that for a second and let me get a laser pointer here. So you come down from that area down through the trachea which is the windpipe and then the trachea branches into the right and left bronchus and that's where the pipe um, that was initially called the trachea is now called the bronchus once it branches at this point which is called the carina one bronchus goes to the right lung the other bronchus goes to the left lung the l stands for lung and then the bronchi branch further and further and further and the yellow line shows you the cut that we typically make to show you sections for histology so the cut goes across the bronchus it's transverse and then that cut uh, looks like a like a circle because we're cutting across uh, a pipe like structure. So again, a bronchus is just a tube that brings air down from the nose and mouth into the lungs. Now this is the view uh, that a bronchoscopist sees. A bronchoscopist, uh, a bronchoscopist is a doctor, uh, a medical doctor who is a pulmonologist. That means he's trained, he or she is trained in the uh, in diseases of the lung and they take a another tube that goes within the windpipe or the tube that brings the air down so they take another tube uh, and put it down the windpipe and then that tube has a little camera in it and you're seeing the view that that camera shows you inside the breathing tubes that constitute the trachea and bronchi so at the point the carina that the bronchi branch off that's the point that we're looking at here so this point here is the carina and then you're looking at the tube that's going into the left side and then the tube that's going into the to the right side which is to the lungs so the right main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus so this is as a um, uh, kind of inside view uh, of the bronchi that's what they look like from the inside so you're looking at the mucosal side of the bronchus uh, with this view now coming back to this branch so uh, I, as I explained again, um, this is uh, the branching of the trachea into the two bronchi going to the two lungs and the section that I showed you, this yellow one will now correspond to the one that I'm going to show you in the next slide. So that's what it looks when you take a section of that, stain it with a hematoxylin and eosin stain um, and show it in histology or pathology. So the thing that's most striking about a bronchus right off the bat at this very low magnification is this purple structure here in the wall and that purple structure is cartilage. So cartilage is a definitional feature of a bronchus. A bronchi are defined by the presence of cartilage. If you have an airway that doesn't have cartilage, it's called a bronchiole and that's a much smaller branch of the bronchus. The other thing that you see right off the bat is this is the lumen or the space within the windpipe or the bronchus and that's where the air goes in through. So that's the lumen. And this part that's inside of the bronchus is uh, the part that has the mucosa and the submucosa. So it's actually quite a thin layer compared to the uh, thickness of the, the cartilage itself, which forms the bulk of the bronchial wall. And then on the outside of the bronchus is the layer called the serosa, which is actually part of the interstitium uh, that we talked about in the previous lecture on alveoli. So that's the low power overview. One more thing I can show you at low magnification is this part, which is the submucosa has lots of glands and we'll see all of this stuff uh, at high magnification later. And finally, the most innermost part of the lining uh, of the bronchus and of the mucosa right there is where we'll see the epithelium and, and the epithelial cells later. You can also see that here is a very thin line at this low magnification. You can't see any cells there, but I'll show you more later. This thing here on the left side is nothing. It's just an air bubble. So there, so it's an artifact. Now, the airways, uh, the airways um, are, a, are an umbrella term to encompass both bronchi and bronchioles. So the bronchi are the bigger airways that contain cartilage, as you see here, and submucosal salivary type glands. The bronchioles are smaller Usually they're less than a millimeter in size, but I don't like to stress that because that's not really the, the best way to tell them apart. The best way to tell bronchi and bronchioles apart is cartilage and submucosal glands. So the ones that have them are bronchi. The ones that don't have them are bronchioles, but both bronchi and bronchioles together 
are called airways. Now, if you remember from the previous lecture, the lumens of the um, alveoli are called air spaces, and so there's a difference there. These, um, uh, you know, these tubular structures are called airways, whereas the lumens of the alveoli are called air spaces. And again, I'll stress, if you have an airway with cartilage, by definition, that is a bronchus. That's the easiest way to tell a bronchus apart from a bronchiole. Another um, concept I want to explain to you guys is the concept of the bronchovascular bundle. And what that means is a bundle like this cord I'm showing you here, where you have a bronchus and you have a vascular structure, which is uh, the artery. So let's just uh, imagine here that the bronchus is this, um, this uh, brown structure. So within the bronchovascular bundle, if you have a bronchus here, you always, always, have an artery next to it. And we're going to imagine that this blue structure here is an artery. And that artery is always a branch of the pulmonary artery. The, so at the hilum of the lung, the main bronchus and then the main pulmonary artery run together in a bundle. And then as they start branching, the, another, the branch of the bronchus runs with a branch of the pulmonary artery, then a smaller branch of the bronchus with a smaller branch of the pulmonary artery, all the way out till the smallest bronchioles which also run with a branch of the pulmonary artery. So that's that's something to remember. There's always a branch of the pulmonary artery, not the bronchial artery, that you that is most easy to see uh, in this bundle, and it always runs with a bronchus. Now you might think, well, what is this third structure there? Well, there's a bronchus, there's an artery, so there must be a vein with it, right? Now that is true only at the hilum of the lung. So there's these these three structures together at the hilum of the lung, but as the um, structures begin to branch into the um, into the segments of the lung. At that point, the veins diverge from this bundle and there's no longer a vein with the bronchus and the artery. So at that point, the vein goes its own way, which is it goes into the equivalents of the interlobular septa and the, the little connective tissue sheets that dip in from the pleura. So the veins branch off to the side and are not part of the bronchovascular bundle. So what can you think of this third structure as? Well, Typically, the lymphatics stay with the bronchovascular bundle all the way from the beginning to the end. So you can think of these three structures as the bronchus, the pulmonary artery, and a lymphatic. Then a smaller bronchus, smaller pulmonary artery, smaller lymphatic, and that's that triumvirate so, uh, kind of goes all the way till the end. But the easiest to see together are this, uh, the bronchus and the artery. It's very easy to appreciate that they always run together. And then you can think of this white cover as the interstitium that's, that's covering uh, this bronchovascular bundle sheet. Now here's a beautiful picture taken by one of our uh, visitors from Germany, Frieda Bruhl. He's going to be our, our resident soon. Um, and this was a picture that he took to correlate the, the gross and histologic features in, in a very abnormal lung. So this is not normal lung histology. But I just want to show you how this bundle works. So in this section, which corresponds perfectly to, so this um, uh, rectangle corresponds perfectly, or whatever this is called, rhomboid, um, corresponds per perfectly to this rectangle. So you know this uh, lymph node corresponds to that one, that lymph node corresponds to this one, the bronchus under this lymph node corresponds to this bronchus. But this area I want you to look at is this. So these three lumens correspond to these three lumens on the right side. And so this artery, which is very abnormal, is a branch of the pulmonary artery. There's a lot of actually fibrosis in the intima, so this is not normal at all. Um, but this is the pulmonary artery. And as expected, there is a bronchus next to it. The bronchus has branched, so you're seeing two lumens instead of one. And on the left side, you can't really see the cartilage, but on the right side, you do see cartilaginous plates. So there's cartilage here, there's cartilage over here, and that defines uh, the fact that this uh, structure is a bronchus, and these two things together constitute the bronchovascular bundle. There are probably lymphatics in here too, but lymphatics are harder to see uh, than the main bronchovascular bundle. So that's the point I want to make. These two things always go in pairs. Now the section I'll be showing you is again we're we're taking a circle now so we've cross-sectioned that pipe and of the cross-section we're going to change the plane of section that we submit for histology and take a section like this so one side will be the luminal side the other side will be the outside you know facing out 
and that's the section that I'm going to show you in the next slide. So let's go there. So to the right is the luminal side. That's the lumen where the air is. And that side is the wall. And that side will be the, you know, to the left will be then the adventitia and the interstitial. So there are a couple of things you can see right here. You can see that there is a, uh, that is cartilage on the left here. There are bronchial glands, salivary type serum mucinous glands. This whole structure here is the mucosa and submucosa. And then the innermost part of the mucosa is the respiratory epithelium, which is over here. So we've, we've labeled that. Number one is cartilage. Number two is the uh, outermost part of the submucosa with the submucosal salivary type glands. We have not labeled what separates the mucosa and the submucosa, which is this very thin layer of smooth muscle. So the smooth muscle is typically the border between the mucosa and submucosa. In the um, bronchus, the problem is that the smooth muscle layer is not always um, evident um, or visible, um, which means that the mucosa and submucosa is not always possible to tell apart. So sometimes I just call this bronchial wall and have the whole thing included in it. Um, but the point to remember is that the mucosa and submucosa are not always easy to tell apart uh, because the smooth muscle is not always visible. Uh, so number three here is the mucosa. And number four here is also part of the mucosa, but the innermost layer, which is the epithelium. We'll flip the uh, section now so that the lumen is to the top and the outside is to the bottom. Again, number one is cartilage. Number two is the submucosal glands. Now these glands are salivary type glands, just like salivary glands in your mouth and cheek, the ones that make saliva or spit. The same kinds of glands are present also in the bronchus. And in the bronchus, they make mucin. Actually, the bulk of the mucin that comes into the lumen of the bronchus is made by the mucinous cells, these guys over here, the mucinous cells of the uh, submucosal salivary type glands or serum mucinous glands. Why they're called sero is that there's another kind of gland too, which is a less uh, pale, the, you know, the paleness comes from mucin and they're a little bit darker and that darkness comes from the serous um, granules. So there are both serous type glands and mucinous type glands here and it's the mucinous type glands that make the bulk of the mucus that is present at the surface. Now these glands actually have a duct which you can't see in this section and that duct opens out onto the surface and that's how it con connects with the lumen of the bronchus. Number three is uh, here is the mucosa or you can say the combination of the mucosa and submucosa. These little dot, uh, circles that you can see in there are the capillaries and the red things inside the capillaries are red blood cells. There's a nice view of it over here, a capillary with red blood cells. And then the pink stuff in here is, is collagen and the little nuclei are fibroblasts. And number four is the surface respiratory epithelium, which we'll go into in detail. So again, cartilage, bronchial glands, mucosa, epithelium. I do want to explain something about the mucosa because you'll hear about this in many different places in the body. You'll hear about this in the gut, in the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract. You'll hear about it in the urinary bladder. You'll hear about it in the mouth and you'll hear about it, of course, in the respiratory tract, in the bronchus. So what the mucosa is, is the innermost lining of anything. Uh, and the way you can think about it is if you think of the innermost part of the bronchus, the one that I showed you, the bronchoscopist sees, if you think of the innermost part um, of the bronchus, the, the, um, the layer that lines it is the mucosa. And that is sort of like a carpet. So if you think of this carpet as the mucosa, you can almost think of the mucosa as a layer that can be peeled off. And in which case, these little uh, things on the surface of the carpet would be the most um, superficial epithelial cells. So the epithelial cells are actually the innermost part of the mucosa and the mucosa is like the carpet. So what would be left when you peel off the mucosa? Well, the submucosa would be under it. So that would be submucosa there. And below that, the floor under that would be the bronchial wall or cartilage. And then if there's even, even further out or below that would be the adventitia or serosa. So that's what uh, the layers um, are like in, in any kind of luminal hollow organ and that the mucosa is always the innermost part of it. And that includes, typically the mucosa includes both the epithelial cells and a little bit of 
stromal or, or packing material or supporting material that's below the epithelial cells. So the mucosa is not just the epithelial cells, it's the epithelium plus the underlying supporting substance. Um, I'd also point out that if you just imagine that the smooth muscle cells are on the undersurface of this carpet, then you can see why the smooth muscle cells or the, the muscularis mucosae in the, in the gastrointestinal tract would be the equivalent, why those would be the dividing layer between the uh, mucosa and the submucosa is because they're at the plane that separates the, uh, the two structures. So if you think of it like this, now if you go back to our original bronchoscopist uh, view, then you can see the epithelial cells would line the inside of this view. They would be the most inside cells. Of course, the, I've made it much bigger than they actually are. You cannot see the epithelial cells with the naked eye because they're so small. Um, but I'm trying to show you that that's where the epithelium uh, actually exists. Now, microscopically, this is what it looks like. So there's the lumen. Here's the epithelium. This part just under the epithelium, the supporting part is the uh, mucosa. It ends where the smooth muscle begins. And then there's the smooth muscle. And then below the smooth muscle is the submucosal layer or submucosa. And then there's bronchial type, you know, the salivary type glands are in here in the submucosa. If you went even further out, you would see cartilage. If you went even further out, you would see serosa. This is what the smooth muscle looks like um, uh, up close. The cells are elongated and, and pathologists call them spindly. Even I, I guess histologists do too. They're called spindly, elongated cells. So the cytoplasm is this pink stuff in the background. And then the nucleus is this, um, this purple uh, stuff. Each one is the nucleus of an individual cell. You can't see the boundaries of smooth muscle cells well because they kind of merge together or look like they have merged together, but they typically both the cytoplasm and the nucleus of the cell is very elongated, uh, kind of sort of squiggly and, and elongated. So this is what smooth muscle looks like in histologic sections. And of course, this is cartilage. You can tell it very easily by its um, uh, uh, purple color. But the point I wanted to make here is that outside of cartilage is really relatively bland, uninteresting looking stuff. It's mostly collagen and then a little bit of fat. This is the serosa or the outside layer of the bronchus and is, you know, nobody really talks about it because there's not much here to show. There is a lot to show on what's on the innermost side or the epithelial side of the bronchus. So now we're looking at the lumen here and this is the innermost part of the mucosa, which is the epithelium. And that's where all the, the interesting cells are. So the orange arrows actually point to the most cardinal or characteristic cell of the respiratory tract, which is the ciliated columnar cell. These cells are tall. So if you, the base is somewhere there, they're standing on, that's the floor that they're standing on. And they go all the way up till there. And their head has this little, uh, this little bar. And then right over the bar, are these hairs, the hairs are called cilia. And those cilia move and they, they move the mucin and dust particles and bugs um, in a, in a, uh, sort of structure called a mucociliary escalator, which we'll talk about in a second. So that is a ciliated columnar cell. This is a ciliated columnar cell. That's a ciliated columnar cell. And you can see the vast majority of cells in the epithelium here are ciliated columnar cells. Columnar means tall. And so that is the hallmark of the respiratory epithelium. I really love these cells and you'll see in the next couple of pictures how much I love them. So number one shows you a, a the cilia of ciliated columnar cells. Number two shows you that little um, um, sort of linear uh, structure that the cilia rest on, which is called the terminal bar. Now the cells also rest on a, on a structure called the basement membrane at the base, which is not the same as the terminal bar. So the cilia rest on the terminal bar, but the whole cell rests on the basement membrane. Uh, number three is the nucleus, um, which is that purple structure over there. Each cell has a nucleus of its own. And then each cell has its own cytoplasm as well, which is number four. Now you'll see how much I love these ciliated cells. I've shown, I'm, I've taken a picture of these on, on different stains. So this stain is not a hematoxylin neosin stain. This is called a diffquick uh, stain, which cytopathologists use to look at cells. It's a beautiful, beautiful stain. And here you can see the beauty of these ciliated columnar cells. These are the normal cells of the inside of your windpipe and the inside of your uh, the tubes that take air into your lungs. 
and they have these characteristic hair-like structures on the top labeled uh, as you see here with the cilia the terminal bar the nucleus and the cytoplasm i'll change the stain now this stain is a papa nicolau stain the same uh, person who uh, named after the same person after whom the pap test um, is named and here again you can see the colors that have changed but the cells are the same uh, this is again a very very beautiful stain uh, that cytopathologists use number one is cilia number two is the terminal bar down at the bottom left number three points to the to a nucleus and number four points to the cytoplasm of one of these cells and i couldn't resist but to make the comparison between these ciliated columnar cells and one of the sesame street characters uh, I do think one of these is actually not a ciliated cell, and this is actually a mucus-filled cell. Notice that it doesn't have cilia, so this is a goblet cell or mus mucus-filled cell, which we're going to talk about in a second. But note the beautiful, beautiful cilia on these uh, um, respiratory um, ciliated columnar cells. So back to an HNE stain section, and and now we're going to talk about goblet cells. So I briefly showed that to you on the previous slide, but the goblet cells are mixed in with the ciliated cells. They're far fewer than ciliated cells. So there's an occasional one, you know, every 10 or 20 cells. And then um, the, the characteristic feature is that the top of this goblet cell is filled with mucin, this pale white, very light blue or gray or white substance which gives the appearance to the cell of a goblet, like, like a wine glass, you know? So just imagine that that is a wine glass, and then this is the stem of the wine glass. So that structure is called a goblet uh, cell after that kind of a structure. And that's another goblet cell. This is another goblet cell. Now these cells also produce mucin, just like the cells, the, the mucinous cells that I showed you before, deeper down in the submucosa, but these, uh, produce the minority of the mucin that eventually ends up in the lumen. The majority comes from the uh, submucosal glands. So these are goblet cells. Here's another stain, a Movat pentachrome stain, meaning it has five different colors. So it just gives you a different flavor than the hematoxylineosin stain. And one cool thing it does is that it stains mucin green. So you can see now the goblet cells are here and here and here. So the goblet cells really stand out on the stain. It's very beautiful. Another thing it shows you is that in the mucosa, these guys are capillaries, but the thing it shows you is this black structure here, and that is actually elastic tissue in the mucosa. And elastic tissue is very difficult to see on, an, on a hematoxylineosin stain, but you can bring it out on a stain like a Movat pentachrome or other elastic stains like a Verhoff van Giesen, and it's it stands out as this black structure. So the supporting material that's in the mucosa consists both of collagen, uh, which is yellow on, on this stain, and then elastin, which is black on this stain. So it's it's like the supporting, like if you think of a mattress, that would be the the you know the fluffy stuff that's the, that's inside it. And this stain also shows the uh, smooth muscle uh, layer that supports that uh, that uh, separates the mucosa up here from the submucosa down here. So this is really a beautiful stain to, to highlight the various parts um, of the most superficial part of, of the mucus. Now the mucociliary escalator is an, is an interesting concept. And what that means is that the cilia uh, beat in unison in, in one direction and carry little dust particles and pieces of debris and stuff that you want to get rid of from the lung. It carries it up the tube. So the opposite of the direction that uh, that the air is going when it when you breathe in so it's going out up and out of the lungs to be eventually either swallowed or spit out um, and what the cilia do here is that they pick up this just imagine this guy here is a bug or a dirt particle and the cilia uh, beat so that this particle this guy eventually goes off in one direction and just imagine that some of these people are goblet cells and are are uh, spitting up pieces of slime up here to make this transition uh, easier so that that combination of mucus and the cilia uh, constitute the mucociliary escalator and their function is to move particles up and out of the respiratory tract. This is the normal basement membrane and then go back again to the asthmatic basement membrane and see how, how thick it is. Another change that you see here which is typical of asthmatic um, uh, mucosae is that there is marked goblet cell hyperplasia. And by that we mean that there are hyper, meaning more 
dysplasia, meaning the cells are actually more in number, more in number. So the goblet cells here are far, far more in number than they would be in a normal respiratory epithelium. So that goblet cell hyperplasia partly accounts for um, the increased mucus that forms in asthma and that, that mucus plugs up the um, respiratory tract and makes it difficult to breathe. So that's one of the mechanisms that makes it difficult to breathe in asthma. And the basement membrane thickening and the goblet cell hyperplasia are two of the pathologic changes that you can see uh, in this disease. Now we come back to normal and uh, go further down in the in the mucosa. So we are now here in the supporting structure and these wavy pink things uh, that you see here almost look like the smooth muscle I showed you before but are not quite as tightly packed. These are collagen bundles. This is again an acellular sort of packing substance um, that cells produce in the mucosa and the cells that produce it are in the next picture these ones fibroblasts so the what the orange arrows are pointing to are the nuclei of the fibroblasts and the fibroblasts are the cells that actually produce the collagen that you saw in the previous picture so these are just cells that produce packing material and give some structure to the uh, mucosa the mucosa also has of course capillaries it also has nerves it has an occasional inflammatory cell but really is otherwise quite um, uninteresting in a normal um, uh, in a normal bronchus. Now one thing I didn't mention up in the uh, epithelial cells is the presence of these basal cells. They're called basal because they're at the base of the epithelium just above the basement membrane. So these cells also lie on top of the basement membrane and why I didn't show you these cells on the HNE sections is because they're very difficult to see on the HNE. Uh, sections. You can see the nuclei, but you can't tell for sure whether it's the nucleus of a basal cell or the nucleus of a ciliated columnar cell because they're so crowded and, and squished together. But this kind of a stain, and this stain is a P40, you can also do a P63 stain, it's an immunohistochemical stain. Um, it colors the basal cells brown, the nuclei of the basal cells brown. So each nucleus that you're seeing here that is brown is the nucleus of a basal cell and you can see how many there are down there and um, it's thought that these are some sort of a progenitor cell. Uh, they are also thought to be the cells that um, uh, are associated with squamous cell carcinoma, a kind of lung cancer. Um, now it's controversial whether they give rise to that kind of cancer or they're more primitive stem cells that give rise to the cancer but they're the uh, squamous cell cancers also stain for the same markers, P63 or P40, so they're very similar in that way. So these are basal cells at the base of the epithelium. Notice that a submucosal salivary type gland also has these P40 positive cells, and these cells are called myoepithelial cells. So they, are, they stain similarly to basal cells, but they would also stain for smooth muscle markers, and they have a contractile function, so they help these glands to um, sort of squish so that they can squeeze their secretions out into the bronchial lumen. So those are basal cells. And then there's another kind of cell in the epithelium that is very difficult to see, difficult or impossible to see on the HNE stain section, and that is the neuroendocrine cells. Um, and these are very, it's very uh, complicated to explain what neuroendocrine means in a short amount of time, but just suffice it to say that these cells have a very specialized function and these cells, um, may give rise to uh, other kinds of tumors in the lung, such as carcinoid tumors and a very dreaded form of lung cancer called small cell lung carcinoma. And these cells are also named uh, Kulchitsky cells after uh, Kulchitsky, who was a, a, a Russian guy who named these cells. I think it was in the GI tract that he named them, but similar cells are also present in the uh, respiratory tract in the bronchus, as you see here. Now, one thing you'll see is that as opposed to the basal cells, the Kulchitsky cells are actually very few in number. There's one here and there's one here. The stain that we've used here is synaptophysin, but you can use other stains to bring those out too. Um, the thing to notice is how much fewer they are in number compared to the ciliated columnar cells and the basal cells. Now, I'll show you, come back to the HNE, and and you know, you just know that down here there are basal cells based on what I showed you. You know that some of these nuclei belong to basal cells, but it's hard to be sure which ones they are 
without actually doing this the stain and of course um, you know that some of them are also neuroendocrine cells but they are absolutely impossible to see on an on a standard 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 stain i also want to talk about uh, this concept of pseudo stratified epithelium and for that i've just made this this simple diagram just to show you what the difference is between simple stratified and pseudo stratified epithelium so if you think of the uh, red line as the basement membrane the basement membrane is what any epithelium sits on so in a simple epithelium the there's basically one layer of cells there's only one row of cells and they all sit on the basement membrane the nuclei are at the same level it's a very simple arrangement so it's a simple epithelium they are not stratified meaning that there's no cell piled up on the original cell there's nothing over here there's just one layer of cells simple epithelium then there's a stratified epithelium of the kind you might see in the skin and what happens in stratified epithelium is that there's a basal layer that sits on the basement membrane then there's another layer of cells on top of it that layer is typically a little bit shorter then another layer that's typically a little bit shorter and there are many many layers one after the other after the other so there's stratification and the nuclei are at different levels because they are you know truly at different levels uh, in the epithelium now what pseudo stratified means is that it looks stratified because the nuclei are at different levels but actually there is no stratific true stratification in other words the cells don't lie on top of each other in fact as you see here each cell truly rests on the basement membrane just as a simple epithelium does so this cell is resting on the basement membrane so is this little guy over here so is this big goblet cell resting on the basement membrane and this ciliated cell is resting on the basement membrane too but because the nuclei are squished together and because the um, this cell let's let's um, imagine this is a basal cell uh, is distorting this space the nuclei are sort of at different levels because of the varying uh, shapes and configurations of the cell so they appear to be at different levels but they are act all the cells are actually resting on the basement membrane so this is not a truly stratified epithelium which is why it's called pseudo stratified i think um, personally i think even the goblet cells give rise to this appearance because this big mucin blob occupies the top of the cell pushing the nucleus to the base so it looks like this nucleus is lower and that is higher but that's only a function of this nucleus being pushed down by the mucus so the pseudo stratified appearance is a characteristic of respiratory epithelium that you see um, in the bronchi pseudo stratified epithelium i'll show you that on the hne so that's what it looks like on the hne there's so many nuclei at different levels that it looks like it should be stratified but actually it is not and all these cells are actually resting on the base sometimes they taper down to the base just to be able to sort of stand on the base like an ostrich so this is pseudo stratified the the concept of pseudo stratified we know that that's a bronchus i mean we don't see cartilage there so i'll show you a deeper level a picture of a deeper level of the same tumor and here you can see that the tumor is abutting or touching the cartilage so you know because there is cartilage here that this is actually a bronchus not a bronchiole so i'll um, stop here and summarize what we've learned so the airways consist of the bronchi and the bronchioles um, and an airway with cartilage in the lung is called a bronchus so if you see a, a tubular structure or a cross section of a tubular structure that has cartilage in it and that structure is from the lung that by definition is a bronchus the bronchi also have submucosal salivary glands whereas the bronchioles neither have cartilage nor have submucosal salivary glands but we are going to talk about bronchioles in a subsequent presentation i hope you enjoyed this lecture thank you very much for listening